Welcome to Healing Your Families, where we focus on six areas of help for families, emotional, financial, mental, physical, social, and spiritual. And I am so excited to have a guest today who's an expert on a topic that affects all six areas. Her name is Chantal Donnelly, and she is a physical therapist, a resilience toolkit facilitator, and founder of the company Body Insight. She's also the author of a new book, Settled. I'm so excited to have her tell us about that. Chantal, welcome. Thank you so much, Amalu. I'm really excited to be here. Well, I'm excited to hear. Well, first of all, I want to understand what a resilience toolkit facilitator. Now, what does that mean? So I started my career as a physical therapist and I was working for about, well, about 15 to 18 years as a physical therapist. And I started getting really frustrated that I wasn't able to completely help my patients. What I found is that the majority of my patients were getting better on my table. They were making progress, but they would go back to their stressful life, their stressful job, their whatever it was that was stressful. And you know, everybody has stress, right? So this is the majority of my patients. And what I was finding is that their pain was returning with the stress. It was causing inflammation in the body and the tissue was winding right back up again. So I started looking for solutions. And originally I thought, okay, I'm going to have to completely change careers. I'm going to have to go into, I had an undergrad in psychology, but I thought I was going to have to get a PhD in it. And I, I didn't really know yet any of the stress science. And so I started doing some research and I had a friend recommend the resilience toolkit to me and a local woman who lives in Los Angeles, where I live, her name is Enkem and Defo was the founder of the resilience toolkit. And so she and I had a lovely conversation one day. I think it went on for a good hour and a half and I kind of geeked out on everything she was telling me. I got really excited about it. And I said, how about you come and do one of your workshops because she had these courses. And I said, can you do one for me and my friends at my, my physical therapy studio? So she came and there was probably about six of us and she went through, it was uh, three times, once a week for three weeks, um, this workshop. And I really enjoyed it, loved her. And about a year later, I was still thinking about it. And I had done more research on the stress science really liked her approach. It's very trauma informed. Um, and I thought, you know, I think I want to get certified in that. And so I applied to join the Resilience Toolkit Facilitator um, course and ultimately became certified. Um, and so now that is part of what I offer my patients and what it is, is a long, <laughs> reply to your question as to what it is. The resilience toolkit is a way of looking at stress so that you don't pathologize your stress, so that you understand that stress has a purpose, it's adaptive, but also so that you understand that sometimes as humans, we over respond and we can get stuck in a defensive stress response. And when that happens, we lose energy, we lose our ability to connect with our intuition, we lose our ability to connect with others, um, we become all sorts of things that are look like self-sabotage, but really are stress responses. And so with the Resilience Toolkit, it's that understanding, there's sort of a fluency of stress that you gain. And then on top of that, you then learn, okay, when do I need to calm my nervous system down? Because we don't always need to be calm. Again, there are times when stress is very adaptive and necessary and helpful. When is it that it's no longer serving you? And that is what you learn with the Resilience Toolkit information. And then you learn, okay, if it's not serving me anymore, what are some tools that I can do? Okay, now as a physical therapist, I thought it was all going to be brain stuff. I thought it was going to be positive thinking or meditation or therapy. 
but it turns out that stress lives in the body. So I didn't need a new career. I just needed to expand my physical therapy into nervous system work, right? And so the curated tools that NCHEM and DEFO pull together for the resilience toolkit are body based tools. They're body up tools. So they allow you to talk to your nervous system and say, no, I don't need this kind of a stress response. I'm actually pretty safe right now. There's no threat. And so in that dialogue with your body and saying to your body, everything's okay, you can calm your stress response down and make it more appropriate for the situation. That is so powerful. I love it. It, it reminds me of some of what yeah, I read, you know, the book by Dr. Bruce Lipton, The Body Keeps the Score. And, and I've heard from several sources, it's that mind-body connection. Yeah. You mean Bezel van der Kolk, Body Keeps the Score. Yeah. Oh, I am so sorry. It's uh, okay. Dr. Bruce Lipton was um, the biology of belief. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, Vanderkolk is a big guy in the trauma informed world and the nervous system world. And uh, yeah, that book is wonderful. Yes. Yeah. Um, and, and he does, he talks a lot, right, about the body up types of uh, tools. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I loved the parts that explain how the, the, the different methods of healing. So you found it, you've got this, and you offer this now. I offer this now. I wrote about it because when I was talking to my patients and I was talking to my girlfriends, really, and they all said, this is the coolest information I've ever received. It's so helpful. And why don't you write a book about it? And I started really trying to write a book about stress from a physical therapy perspective. And um, I have to say, a lot of my friends who were finding that this information was, was helpful were parents. And in my journey, I found this information around the time that my son was in middle school. Now, I wish, I have regrets, that I didn't know this stuff when he was younger. Because as a parent, this is a game changer. Well, you know, we is isn't hindsight 2020. You know, we can always... but. And we, the only thing we can do from the past is learn from it. But now you have this information and you have it to share with new parents. Tell us about your book. The book is called Settled, How to Find Calm in a Stress-Inducing World. And it just came out about a week or two ago. And I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to help a lot of people. Um, the book is divided into two parts. Part one is the foundation what do you need to know before you do a tool? Because everyone is looking for the magic pill, right? They, <laughs> they all want to find calm. We all do. But I felt it was really important for people to understand why being calm 24-7 is not really the goal. Again, our stress is important to us. And those stress responses that we have actually help us especially in the acute phase of stress, right? It helps our immune system. It helps our thinking, our focus, our performance, all of that. Um, it's when stress becomes chronic, when we get stuck in the physical, or excuse me, in the stress world, um, we talk a lot about um, a al broken alarm system as an analogy. So it, it's if you can think of a home alarm system, um, when we are stuck in a defensive stress response, it's almost like our alarm system is going off for no reason. So maybe there's a squirrel running on your roof, the wind is blowing your window, and your alarm system is calling the fire department and the police department, right? And that's sort of like what it's like being stuck in a stress response when it's no longer serving you. Everything becomes stressful, the big stuff, the little stuff and everything in the middle, everything becomes stressful. So you might find yourself at the grocery store and the checkout line is long and somebody cuts in front of you when the new checkout person opens up their line and you lose it, right? It's like all the things that maybe wouldn't have bothered you so, so much before, now that you are stuck in that stress response, spills over to every aspect of your life. 
and and that can happen so easily in family life. You know, the, oh. the person you love the most comes home from work and says the wrong thing or does, and all of us, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. I have a, I have a section in my book called the barometer or brat game. And I talk about, um, my son's bedroom and he's a teenager. Okay. I think when I was writing it, he was 18, he's 19 now. And you know, the messy bedroom, the messy boys, teenager bedroom, and that can really bother a mom. Well, sometimes it bothers me and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I walk by his room and I'm like, Oh, teenagers <laughs> so silly you know they don't like to clean their room and then other times I walk by and smoke comes out of my ears I am so upset and I started thinking like you know it's not that my kids being a brat because last week his bedroom looked exactly the same and it didn't bother me my son is a barometer for my nervous system Ooh, I like that Oh, yeah, to take that perspective. Yeah, and it, you know, it doesn't always work if you're in an abusive relationship. Don't try this with your spouse if he's abusive or she's abusive. However, it works fairly well in other aspects, in other ways, you know, because even when we go to work, let's say, it doesn't even have to be within our, our family community. It can be our work community. How are we going to work what where are we in our nervous system are we in fight flight are we somewhere between calm and, and fight flight which gives us a little bit of energy that we need to be at work or are we in freeze do we not want to be around other people do we want to hide are we feeling very self-critical and so somebody can say something to you at work and if you're in a freeze response from whatever happened before you got to work you're going to take that very personally and 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 almost feel like you should feel shame, right? Because whatever someone says to you when you're in that place, you're going to take inward and blame yourself. Or if you're in fight flight, when you get to work, you're going to take that personally and, and blame the other person and feel very aggressive towards them. Completely different if you get to work and you're in a calm nervous system. Now, I, I love your point that we can't, label stress is bad. We need it. If you get to work and there's a deadline to be met, you do need to kick in the energy. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The problem is that we have a lot of deadlines in life. Yes. And we are supposed to toggle in and out of a stress response and then back to calm and then back to the stress response to deal with our deadline and then back to calm when we get home and we have children and a spouse. If we are not able to make that toggle, we don't have that flexibility in our nervous system to go back to a, a calm state, we get stuck. And so life becomes a deadline. Everything we do becomes a deadline. And so you walk into a situation maybe with a child, and if it's a young child under the age of nine, they imitate your nervous system. They haven't really developed their own nervous system preferences yet. So they're going to imitate whatever you do. So if you're still in fight or flight because you've left work and you, you still have that deadline, or maybe you reach the deadline you successfully, but you've still carried that stress and franticness with you, your child will pick that up. And now it's their part of their nervous system state. Right. And so around and around we go, because now you're both co-regulating at a at a high vibration. You know, that is the best and most detailed description I have heard of t bringing your work home. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, be aware of that, that. OK, now I'm I'm assuming that in your book, you're preparing them in the first part. Yes. How to use a tool. And, and I totally agree with you. We quite often are looking for a magic pill or someone with a magic wand who can make our problems go away. And the fact is we have to do that ourselves. But then in the second part, are you offering tools that will help them make that transition? I am. Yeah. The whole entire second half of the book is all tools and I've broken it down into chapters um, such as breathing, 
ex movement, exercise, stretching, eating, and mindfulness. And I think a lot of people immediately will say, oh, breathing. I know how to breathe. I know all about the, 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 the breathing. So the twist with me is that I teach why breathing can be calming and why it can actually wake you up a little bit. And it increases your nervous system state a little bit. Um, and I talk about the difference of those two things. And then I talk about why breathing might not work for some people and what they can do about it, right? So what we know about breathing, for example, is that when you inhale, your heart rate goes up a little bit, okay? That's just a biological thing that happens with humans. When we exhale, our heart rate goes down a little bit, okay? So we can take advantage of that if we are looking to calm by lengthening our exhalations, okay? so. What we know then is that if you were to take, let's say three count inhale, then you would want to lengthen your exhale to about six counts. And that would be called a calming or a settling breath. Okay. Now, some people, when they inhale, they lift their shoulders up a little bit and engage their, their upper chest cavity and their neck muscles. Okay. Now, as a physical therapist, I know that there are these muscles right on either side of your throat called your scalene muscles. Okay. They're designed to help move your neck, but they are also called accessory breathing muscles. So what does that mean? They are muscles that when you are in fight or flight are designed to bring in just a little bit more oxygen, a little bit more of that inhale so that you can run away from lions, tigers, and bears, or a deadline at work, right? So scaling muscles are used in an emergency. Unfortunately, as humans, we all feel like we're constantly in survival mode. And so our scalenes tend to be pretty tight. And as a physical therapist, I have felt many a tight scalene. There is a correlation between stress and neck pain, and that makes perfect sense. Right. So going back to our breathing chapter, what we want to do is not engage the scalenes. We want to tell our body, no, we're not going to use our neck and upper chest because that is our fight flight activation. And we are currently trying to calm. So that's why you always hear yoga instructors or Pilates people telling you to breathe from your belly or your, your lower rib cage. Right. That takes it out of the neck. Now, for some people, it's still hard to get out of the neck, even with the cueing of breathe from your belly, breathe from your diaphragm. So I, in the breathing chapter, will teach people how to stretch the scalene muscles. And that kind of gives you a little bit of a, a helpful push so that when you do your breathing technique, you don't get into your neck. So that's the kind of stuff that I cover from that physical therapy perspective. You, you also indicate that you're offering several tools. And I love the value of having a toolbox. Like you mm -hmm. said, one tool doesn't necessarily work for everyone. But if you have several to choose from, you would soon find out the ones that were most effective for you. Absolutely right. Situation. Absolutely right. There are some people who actually get more anxious with breathing. Right. So I want my readers of the book to really play detective and find out, like, is this really helping me? And I teach ways in which, you know, if your nervous system is responding well to a tool, basically we call them down regulation cues or, or signals. So is your nervous system down regulating? Right. And really, and I think that's our, our a problem with self-care in our culture is that everyone's really into self-care. And I think that's fabulous. But if your self-care isn't down regulating your nervous system, is it really helping you? Or is it just that your girlfriend told you it was helping her? And so you're jumping on the bandwagon. Right. Because at that point, then you got to put that on your list of things to do. And it's really not helping you. It's just adding to your list of things to do and adding to your to-do list-itis, as I call it, right? So really knowing if a tool is helping you is something I, I emphasize in the book. I want people to not just take what I say and assume it's going to help them. Find out what helps your nervous system. What do you need? 
you know, just that alone is of great value, just understanding your body. So many, so often in our modern life, we become disconnected mm -hmm. with our body. We're not, and it takes time and effort to get that connection between mind and body. I remember a time when I would seemingly feel like for some unknown reason, my lower back just goes out. I don't know why. But as I started learning, engaging in more practices, I began to tell when it was strained, when I needed to stretch, when I needed to rest. So that gift alone of under recognizing what's helping you, that's huge. I, I think it's a really big deal. I like to think of myself as a spokesperson for the body. I'm, I'm, I'm the PR marketing person for the body. I'm trying to bring the body back. <laughs> and, you know, dissociation from the body is, is a stress response. A lot of people need that stress response because what they're feeling in their body is so uncomfortable that they just can't live there. And so they dissociate. And isn't uh, that the first step in healing from trauma is to get that connection restored? Yeah, and it, it, it is. And it needs to happen very slowly for a lot of people. Um, and there, so that connection between your brain and body and really knowing and, and what's going on inside your body is called interoception. And there's a lot of research happening uh, in, the, in the science world around interoception and how it can help people and improves resilience and improves all sorts of wonderful things. Um, and yes, it is a really big stepping stone for healing from trauma. Um, you have to go slowly because if you haven't lived in your body for a while, for a good reason, if you just jump right into your body, that can be difficult. And so I actually teach tools to reconnect with your body. So one of them would be exercise, for example. And what I, what I say in that chapter is, you know, if you are finding yourself, you keep saying like, why am I not going to the gym? I promised myself I was going to go to the gym and I keep going back on my promise. I'm good for a week. And then I, and then I stop. And then three months later, I go back and then I stop. It is possible that you are having a stress response because you are reconnecting with your body and that may be too much, too fast, too soon for you. There's the other option too, is that when you exercise, your body releases adrenaline and cortisol. So your brain can't tell the difference between the stress you're trying to avoid and exercise, right? So there's lots of nuances that we don't, we start beating ourselves up. I'm not going to the gym. I'm not taking care of myself. I'm so self-disciplined. It could be that it's part of your biology and that really you just need to tell your body that you're safe while you're exercising. So that could mean doing really small, short little bouts of exercise. It could mean always making sure you're listening to happy music when you're exercising, or maybe you exercise with a friend who really makes you feel comfortable and safe and supported. There's lots of tools that we can use to get through that instead of beating ourselves up. So it sounds like this book is for the busy executive, the young mother. Um, my background, I worked with families who had children with special needs. Mm -hmm. And it, it's challenging raising, you know, a child in the best of circumstances. But when you have a child with special needs, you know, multiply it by 10. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't know from experience, although my son is neurodivergent. Um, he has dyslexia and ADHD. So I do know a little bit. Um, and, it, you know, I talked to a parent for an interview for the parenting chapter in my book, and she had a, a child with who dysregulated a lot. And she said, you know, finding the help I needed so that I could calm down was stressful. Right. It's like everywhere she went, she was hitting roadblocks and she was trying to help herself and trying to help her son and really advocate for him and get what he needed. And that was stressful. So all around, she was getting stress on top of stress on top of stress. And she finally worked through it. And she actually um, used settling tools to help her and to help her son. That is wonderful. I'm also thinking of a parent who has 
childhood trauma. Maybe they've made the resolve, I'm not going to raise my children the way I was raised. I'm going to be loving, caring, and patient. And yet, if they can't heal that trauma, and it sounds to me like this is another tool. This is somebody else that would benefit from your book, is someone who wants to heal from their childhood trauma so they can be the type of parent they want to be. It is. It absolutely is. And it really, this type of work really helps you co-regulate with your children, which is so important. It helps build trust between the two of you and love and support. Um, it's It can help in a lot of ways. And one thing I will say too, is even if you're a parent who doesn't have a childhood history of trauma, trauma is pretty sneaky, right? We think of trauma as being these really big things, you know, um, trauma can be something that happened to your grandmother that gets passed down to you, right? There's epigenetic changes, transgenerational stress that can be passed down to you. They've, uh, Dr. Rachel Yuda has done some amazing studies on survivors of the Holocaust, and she has looked at their children and the, her, and then the grandchildren. And what they have found is that the grandchildren actually have really, really low levels of cortisol. So that makes you think, oh, well, they don't stress. But actually what happened is there was an epigenetic change, which means there wasn't a change to the DNA, but certain DNA was turned on or off. Okay. And that changed the receptors that cortisol docks into. And what happened with these grandchildren of Holocaust survivors is that they need very, very little cortisol to feel like a lot of cortisol in their body. So they are stress sensitive. A little bit of stress feels huge to them. And this is not something they went through. They didn't have this trauma. This is a trauma that was literally passed down generation to generation. Um, and we're seeing physiological, biological changes within the chemical makeup of people who, you know, they wonder what's wrong with me. I have a great life. Why am I so stressed? And it turns out it's stress that was passed down. She also did research with um, mothers who were pregnant and living in New York around the Twin Towers during 9-11 and followed their children when they were born to see what happened and saw the same types of changes. So people who, who are stress sensitive, it can be from their, their parents, not necessarily their own trauma. It, it sounds like it's not helpful at all to deny it, oh, I'm fine. And the other extreme where you were overreacting, I've always felt that the only way you could have a truly stress-free life would be to be in a coma. <laughs> but yeah. And even that sounds stressful. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I tried once to have a stress-free life. I talk about it in the book and um, I'm just gonna tell you it doesn't work. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, there are those times where you need to respond quickly. No, you definitely need, you need to have a stress response, um, whether it's in an emergency or if you are dealing with, you know, a toxic boss at work, you don't, you know, you don't want to be calm 24 seven. However, you want to be calm enough when you get home and, and be able to regulate so that you can figure out, okay, am I staying with this job? Mm -hmm. Am I going to find something different? What do I need to do to find something different? How's my resume looking these days? Let me talk to my spouse. Let me, you know, talk to a friend who is uh, in the business, you know, so there's, you can't advocate for yourself and look at ways to change and whether you even need to change if you aren't regulated. Well, that sounds like it's tying in with our emotions. You know, it's like thinking there are good emotions and there are bad emotions and emotion is just energy in motion and we can use that energy to solve our problems reach our goals yeah and it's usually trying to tell you something too but yeah i agree i don't think there's there's bad emotions or good emotions at all i think i think there's like you said there's just it's an emotion it's not good or bad well i love this book it sounds like it's going to be really helpful and i hope so how can people get a copy 
It is available pretty much anywhere where books are sold online. I'm still working on getting it into some independent bookstores. Um, it's currently on Amazon, Barnes and Noble online, those types of places. Um, and um, people can also watch videos where I teach some down regulation tools and I talk more about stress on Instagram and on Facebook. My company's Body Insight. So my Instagram and Facebook handle are at Body Insight Inc. Body Insight Inc. Yeah. And my website is uh, bodyinsight.com. And they and you're on LinkedIn. I am. Yes. Okay. They yeah. can connect with you there. They can go to your website. Yeah. Or yeah. Follow you on Instagram. Yep. Again, lots of good videos there if they're looking for more um, information, some quick little one minute tips on how to regulate the nervous system. And sometimes that's, that's, that's all you need. Sometimes it is. Just, yeah. Let me take it one day at a time. Let me just calm down right now. <laughs> yeah. And it, it really, the reason I wrote the book wasn't so much to get everybody to regulate their nervous system, but because I truly believe that the more people in this world learn how to regulate their nervous system when it's appropriate, the more we can co-regulate with other people and have better relationships. And I just think overall, it's going to make the world a better place. Oh, I am totally with you there. That That's my mantra that Families are the foundation of society. If we can help families learn these skills, we can make the world a better place. If we can just share this so that everyone has that, that opportunity yep. to learn yep. that. Oh, it's huge. Mm -hmm. You're doing wonderful things, Chantal. I oh, thank you. <laughs> and thank you so much for joining us. I, to my viewers, I encourage you to get her book, follow her on Instagram, learn more about these valuable tools that will help you have the family that you want, the quality of family life that you want. So join us again next week at the same time. This is Emily Penrod with HealingYourFamilies.com.